Has anybody heard me give this talk before or this? Okay. I thought if I, if I could, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out what you most want to learn about, and I'll try to save the time for that, because I don't think we have enough time to cover everything I want to cover. But I sort of got this set up where we could stop at any point, and there'll be plenty that you will have been exposed to to make it you know, a good learning experience, I hope. We still don't start for another 10 minutes, so I can just talk about stuff in the meantime. I started realizing I needed to share ideas uh, by, by doing talks and by, by doing workshops about 20 years ago. And I'll tell a little bit of that story when we get started. And I was afraid to be in front of people. I, I would be afraid to be in front of this many people, let alone, uh, you know, some of the conferences I've talked at, there'll be 500 or 1,000 people in the audience. So I had to learn how to keep myself composed and say the things I want to say and not get too nervous while I'm doing it and all of that sort of stuff. And that was literally almost exactly 20 years ago. And I'm kind of able to do it now. But I use the slides to keep me from becoming, from becoming a lost or saying the wrong things or trying to cover too much or trying to do too little. So the slides are my crutch. They help me, they help me stay organized. Whoops, I just pulled the wrong thing up. Well, that tape probably isn't doing much good. Any, oops, I don't even want that. That's what I want. Oh, that's good. It goes to the wrong side of the computer. I'm going to have to turn this around and stand on my head to do the whole presentation, which I don't think is good. We need more of this. Can we do that? I want to get this to fit over here. I don't think that's going to work. We'll need more cord. Look at that. Look at that. We have a, a bucket brigade. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect. That's probably good. That's good. Excellent. Let's see if this works. Beautiful. Oh, that resolution is really excellent, too, isn't it? <laughs> that was sort of being humorous. <laughs> Let's see what happens when I get my slides going. It, it may adjust or something. That usually tries to adjust. I think it just did that. That's not too bad, huh? And I try to make my lettering really large so that it all works. That, that'll probably be OK, don't you think? Excellent. OK, I'm going to get my clicker. We still have four minutes. There's still some room here? There's, rooms, there's room back there. There's some chairs back over there. Yeah, we'll, we'll do our arm wrestling to see who gets which chair, <laughs> right? There you go. So I appreciate that there's so much interest in this. And the reason I'm sharing these things, uh, I'll tell the story of that in a bit. But I think that we definitely need to make improvements in our industry in almost everything we do. And I'm not going to change much in your thinking today, but I'm going to give you a few things to think about. This morning, I got out to take a walk. And I walked across this way, across the road, up where the, where the green line goes. And underneath there, I wanted to find a bunch of local uh, temples, the smaller temples. And I found six or seven. And then I stumbled upon a food market where they, I think uh, three or four things are going on there. They have. People with bigger trucks bringing food to the area. People with car hand carts filling their carts so they can go out and sell fruit, uh, fruit and vegetables out on the street. There are also people that were actually buying stuff, I think, for their restaurants, maybe. And maybe for their homes, but I think it's more like for restaurants. And I took a bunch of photos and I took a bunch of videos. But all I could think was, this is like a complex system that falls from very simple rules. Very simple rules. Does anybody understand Kinefin? Do you know what I mean when I say Kinevin? 
that some of you think about. As I walk through, uh, nowadays, you know, once you read something like the Kinevin framework, you start seeing these patterns everywhere to get yourself, um, you know, you just start trying to rate everywhere you go. Is this a simple, this is an obvious system? Is this a complicated system? Is this a complex system? Is this chaos? Because it looks like it's chaos, but you know it's not chaos. Have you, any of you been to those food markets? Yep. Uh, it's like they just pile the food all over on the ground and, and people walk through. There's always men shouting. I don't know what they're saying. When I walk by somebody, they say, bye, bye, bye. But they're saying something else in other languages I don't speak when I'm not there. I was the only, as far as I could tell, the only you know, American walking through there. So it's clearly not a, meant for general use, but I had a great time. I watched a little boy, maybe four years old, working. I have a grandson who's three and a half, almost four. When I was four, I learned to milk a goat because we lived on a little farm. I learned to, um, I learned to uh, when I was a little older, older uh, how to, uh, to uh, take a chicken that we were going to eat and slaughter it and dress it. So I know we can do these things as very young, but I've watched a little boy very diligently working. I think he was smashing something that would be used to make a drink or something, I don't know what. But uh, he was very methodical in the way he worked. It was really impressive. So am I going to get introduced or I just fire in? Would you prefer a time check? Yeah, please, let me know when we're getting near done. And if I don't notice you, get the audience's attention and they can yell at me, it's time to be done. Because I am really bad with time. OK. OK, so are we ready to start, I think? There's a chair over here. There's a couple over there, some back there. Now, if more people come in, that's OK. It won't disturb us. It certainly won't disturb me. And I want to make a point. If you do not like this and you don't want to stay, don't feel you must stay. Go find somewhere else you will be interested. OK, this is just some things I'm going to share with you. and won't hurt my feelings if you get up and leave in the middle, as long as it's not like all of you. <laughs> <laughs> that will make me feel really bad. <laughs> so some of you sacrifice and stay the whole time. OK, and that still tells us two minutes. But I think it's OK to get started, because there's only a few people that will miss the first few parts. Uh, my name, there's still a few chairs over here. Um, are there any, there's some chairs way back there and some chairs back over there. We can take about maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten or twelve more. It's okay to come in, don't worry, don't worry. It's okay to come in. I'm going to go ahead and get started, but it won't disturb me if you're coming in. How many of you have your phone with you? Okay, so be sure to tweet. Tweet pictures and stuff, OK? It's the only way anybody knows I exist. So if I don't see you using your phone, you're going to get marked down for that, OK? All righty. So as you can see, I'm a lot less afraid being in front of a group of people now, but that took me years to learn to do. Uh, right now, I feel pretty comfortable when I'm covering material I'm really interested in. And this is a topic that I'm very interested in. Uh, at the end of this 90 minutes that we have, you will not know much more about how to deal with the problems with es of estimates. I will tell you, I'm going to try and save time to share with you how I work with estimates. But that isn't uh, meaningful to how you would work with estimates. Uh, I'm not here to tell you how to get rid of them or whether or not you should get rid of them. I'm just sharing some thinking that I, I think would be helpful to our industry to be doing. So the first thing I want to do is an exercise where we're going to gather up from each one of you. There should be post-it notes on every table. You'll just need to use one post-it note, so pass them around so everybody has one post-it note. And hopefully some kind of a, a Sharpie-style marker, but I don't know if we have any Sharpie-style markers, do we? Does everybody have a marker at their tables? Yes. Try, try and use a marker to write down. Um, I'm going to give you it in a second. I want to make sure everybody has your post-it notes. And because we're kind of crowded, usually I would ask that when the post-it notes are filled out, you would carry them forward. But it looks like you have to pass them into maybe the middle, and we'll bring them up here. And um, let me get uh, one of these markers. And I'll tell you what it is I want you to do. And I want you to do this as quick as you can. The reason I'm doing this right now is because I want to get from you what I'm going to ask from you. I want to get it from you before I've told you much about estimates, at which point I will have tainted your thinking, which is called anchoring, 
and I don't want to be guilty of doing that. But the rest of the day, I'm going to be making a lot of fun of estimates. But right now, pretend I didn't say that. OK. So here's what I want you to do as quick as you can. I want you to write down in one word. Let me see if I can get this. What is an estimate? At its heart, what is the essence of what is an estimate? Not are we, what do we use them for? Not what do we make estimates of, but in one word, please write in English, it's the only language I understand, what is an estimate? Write that down as quick as you can and then start gathering them up. One word. Estimates are too hard, yeah. Oh, that's not what you meant. OK, no, you can do it. You can do it. Think of a word that you could use in place of estimate. So br yeah, bring them all, hand them, out, hand them in and bring them up. So, so people in the center, gather them to the people in the center, and then they'll bring them up to me, and we'll put them up over here. Lots and lots of stickies. Thank you. That's very good. Anyone who's a scrum master, you know how this works, so just help. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind, somebody could help me just start sticking them up here. Try to kind of slightly group them, but don't go ahead and put it up there. Oh, yeah, just get them. We're going to have a lot of them, so you got to get them in close. Bring, bring, write it down quickly. Now, if somebody passes you about a, a sticky and you don't like what it says, just crumple it up and put it in your pocket. Okay? Just get them up there quick as we can. Get them up there quick as we can. All right, excellent. Has anybody, I asked earlier, has anybody done this workshop with me before? Show of hands, one, two, two, okay. So you know where this is headed, yeah. Just get them up there, don't worry, just get them up there quick as you can. Don't try to match them, just get them up there. Yeah, don't worry about it, just get them up there. I'll, I'll, I'll gather that, yeah, there we need, we need more room, excellent. So I think there's probably 50 or 60 people here, probably. So we should get up about 50 or 60 stickies. And we have more room over there if we need it, but that's okay for now. That's, I think we got enough room over here. Just get them up there. We'll, I'll revisit this in a while. I just wanted to get it before I've told you much. So then we'll come back and see what you thought before I told you anything. Yeah, there's a lot of stickies there. This is kind of an interesting thing to me, but I, I have noticed this for myself, that I really don't need to do this workshop. If I were to guide you properly and just have you answer certain questions like this, we kind of all come together to a common thinking and, oh, it's telling me we're on battery. I don't want this to run out of power. There we go. Okay, thank you very, very much. That was a favor to me, and we'll revisit this in a little while. So again, now we're going to really start. This is called Beyond Estimates, Estimates or No Estimates. And this is the first part. There's 83 parts. Each one takes about an hour. <laughs> this lists some of the things I'm going to do, but I'm just going to rush ahead with it. So for the first thing is, if you cannot see this, I'm going to move this uh, down just a little bit so that it's not blocking as much. Hopefully that'll help some of you. I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you whether or not you should do it. I'm going to share with you some of my thinking. And by the end, hopefully, I'll take a little time to tell you how I work. But that doesn't tell you how you should work. And I want to make it really clear because I have a couple warnings. People become very defensive when I talk about estimates. It's the reason I talk about estimates. I was uh, asked to give a talk about a big success I had a, on a project back in 2005 or so. And uh, I asked, well, how, what do you want to know? And they said, tell us the things you did and the things you didn't do. And we had used a very much an agile approach to do this work. So when I went to do that talk, I had the things that we did and the things we didn't do. One of the things we did was we worked in trios. This was before mob programming. We worked often with a, a developer, a tester, and a product expert all together you know, at, at one computer. And it worked really well. This was sort of before we had thought of the mob programming way of working. As I gave that talk and I got to the things we didn't do, one of those things was daily stand-ups. We didn't do daily stand-ups because we were working together all day long. We didn't have to know what each other did yesterday or what was blocking them. We already knew. Uh, there were other things we didn't do. 
or uh, certain things we didn't do. And the third or fourth on the list was estimates. And when I said that, it was a group about this many people, I said, we didn't do estimates. And uh, I wasn't giving much of an explanation about it. You know, we didn't feel we needed them. We'd done a value stream map. If you know a value stream map, it showed us one, is a, it's one of the non-value added items on a value stream map. And we want to compress out all the non-value added items. The customer doesn't come in and say, hey, I'd like to buy an estimate. I don't need any work from you. I just want an estimate. You know, no customer ever does that. Or it's rare that they would do that. Customers are interested in having the work done, not in how long it will take. They just want to get it done as quick as they can, usually. OK. When I said that, somebody stood up in the audience, and they said, oh, no, we need estimates. I said, OK, well, I thought, this will be good. Let's hear the argument. And they said, well, here's why we need estimates, they started telling me. And then another person stood up over here and said, no, he's wrong. I thought, oh, good, somebody's already been thinking about not doing estimates. But they said, that's not why we need estimates. Here's why we need estimates. <laughs> So I let that person ramble on for a few moments, and then somebody in the back stood up. And I said, OK, what do you think? And they said, yeah, that's not why we need estimates, and that's not why we need estimates. Here's why we need estimates. It became clear to me pretty quickly that we didn't even know why we needed estimates, let alone, boy, I still keep kicking the power out here. Pardon me. Let alone um, whether they're giving us value or not. And that made it clear to me that this is something we need to be talking about. Now, I'd already learned a few years earlier that we need to be talking about it, 1999, and I'm going to tell that story in just a moment. Uh, but now this showed me that it was pervasive across the industry in such a way that we really needed to have these discussions. So I start thinking about it, and the one thing that I ask is that you keep an open mind. Um, I read a quote somewhere, you can probably tell me where, where it came from, where they said, the sign of intelligence is to be able to hold two contrary thoughts in your mind at the same time without blood coming out of your ears. It was something like that. OK, I don't know how many contra contradictory thoughts we need to keep in our mind right now for a topic like this, but there's a lot. So keeping an open mind allows us to consider the possibility that the thing we believe the most in the thing we have the most trust in might be wrong. It doesn't mean it is, but that is where we tend to fool ourselves. And I do have some slides on that later if we have time. Uh, some of these ideas might not work at the place that you work. Uh, you might need them really badly, but you may never be able to do them there. So don't just rush back after you hear me talk about it and say, hey, at the conference they told us we shouldn't do estimates. Hooray! You know, uh, you'll get fired, so don't go do that. <laughs> I know three people now who've been fired when they try to take this back to their work. So use a little bit of um, clear thinking. Uh, that, by the way, is a picture of my father. Uh, this was before I met him. But um, <laughs> this is something he used to say. There are a thousand right ways to do anything, so never think that ours is the one right way. And he really meant a thousand right ways. He was an engineer. And he solved a lot of important problems for the company he worked uh, for, which was back in, uh, in, the, in the phone company, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And uh, he was a very wise person. I take a lot of what he said. I use it every day now. I wish he was still alive, because I'd like to turn to him and talk to him about the things that I'm, the, the struggles I have. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. This story I call Lessons Learned. I'm going to tell it pretty quick. It was really exactly 20 years ago next month that this started occurring for me. I, got, uh, I took a job at the beginning of 1999 for three months that ended like March 30th, 1999, where we were essentially doing something that is, I would call proto-agile. It was like extreme programming. It was one of the light, they were following lightweight techniques to manage software development in a very small company. And it was highly effective. And I loved it. And I was just switching my career from being in manufacturing to being in uh, software development. I was already 45 years old or so. And I decided to, um, I really liked the way they were working. It made sense to me. And I wanted more of it. So when that contract ended, because it was a very short contract, we finished the work in three months, I went off to find another contract. And I found a company that was hiring 200 developers. Now at that time, I don't know if any of you were working in the late 90s, but by 1999, if you could spell VB, you could get a job writing software. 
And I knew how to spell VB. I could even spell ASP, except I didn't really know how to do it. I bought a book and I read, uh, I, I had the book in front of me during my interview. They did a phone interview. And the person would ask me a question, I said, hmm. And I'd find a thing and I'd answer his question. <laughs> And after about three or four questions, I couldn't find the answer. And he said, you know, I'm looking in the book right now, but um, I can't find the answer to that, so I don't know. They hired me. <laughs> and about uh, two or three months later, I asked the guy who interviewed me, why did you hire me? He said, well, you were the only honest person I interviewed. Because you told me you didn't know and that you were using the book. <laughs> and I said, that's not a bad way to test honesty, really. Because um, I think they knew that nobody knew this stuff. But anyways, let's go on. They were hiring a lot of people, and I was one of the last three people that were hired the week they were starting the project. They had already fired three people that couldn't get along with the boss, so they, they were trying to replace them. But here's what they were going to do. Does anybody know what IID is? Iterative Incremental Development. It's, it's like uh, a spiral model. Before Agile. Six-week iterations, broken into three two-week sessions. Two weeks of design, which included requirements uh, finalization or, or requirements development. Two weeks of coding and two weeks of testing and integrating. Those are really arbitrary numbers. They didn't make sense to me. But I was looking for seeing how the big companies do this work. And this was the closest contract I could find. Uh, that was close to being something like what I was just coming off of. But I really like this. Every six weeks, they were going to do a lessons learned. What did we learn in the last six weeks? So we could apply it to the next six weeks. Now, this was meant to be a three to six month software development app, uh, process. How long is a three to six month uh, time in software development? How long does a three to six month project take? Tell me, one and a half to two years, right? It took them two years to get this into production. And once it was in production, it took them about 18 months to completely cancel the project. They spent something on the order of $75 million in 2000, year 2000 money, year 1999 money. You know, we weren't paying lots of money for our phones back then, right? It was this was a time when, when, two, two, when $75 million really meant something. Right? Nowadays, you know, yeah, they drop that much money weekly on some of these projects. And then we were going to do that over again, okay? So we charged out to do our work, first iteration. We looked at the work that they were planning on doing. We decided what we could do over the next six weeks. We figured out what it was, started doing it. Then it came to, to the coding, you know, and then the testing and integration, and then we did the lessons learned. There were three things that I noticed that we learned. Now, I was just one of 200 developers. I was just, a, just like all the other developers. I wasn't a manager. Uh, I was a, uh, well, by the end of the first three, uh, six weeks, I had elevated to a team lead because they needed some people who could um, review the code that was being checked in. And most of the code being checked in couldn't even compile. So that wasn't so good. So they had to have somebody who could figure out how to make the stuff compile so we could at least test it. And that's so they, they found some tech leads throughout the organization and they raised us up to that. Then we had our lessons learned. The first thing I noticed was the estimates were off. Now, I didn't say anything about it because I wanted to keep my job. But I noticed that everybody was kind of saying the estimates weren't helping us. So what should we do if we're not very good at estimating? What should we do? Yeah, we could play, start playing games with them almost immediately. But what, what, what should we do? Small iterations. Well, we didn't get a choice to do that. What do you think they thought we needed to do? Get better at estimates. Let's get better at estimates because we weren't very good at it. They actually had some people to help us learn to do that. The another thing I noticed was the requirements weren't clear when we started. So what should we do about that? Spend more time understanding the, est uh, the uh, requirements. And that's what they decided to do. We need to get better at understanding the requirements. And then the third thing, these were the things I noticed that were coming up that seemed really important to me. The requirements kept changing. What do we need to do about that? Freeze the requirements. Do these things seem related to you? They seemed related to me. This is a pattern I had seen before in many other things than software development as well. So we worked hard to get better at these things. 
we actually, uh, they brought some people in to train us and show us how to do it. And then we scooted off to do our work. So then, we did that work and we had our second lessons learned. Now this is three months into the thing. We have the lessons learned. I noticed three things that were really prominent in our lessons learned. Does anybody want to guess what those were? Yeah, so I don't need to spend any time showing you this, right? <laughs> Same three things. Now, I had already, I wanted to say, I wanted to stand up and say, I see a problem here. But I kept my mouth shut because I wanted to keep my job. And I was just new into the industry. I, w I felt like I, you know, I was an imposter. You've heard of imposter syndrome. Here's all these kids. Most everybody on this project was 22, 23 years old. I was 45. I was double their age. I was like a father figure to them. <laughs> I didn't want to tell them, I'm seeing a problem here. We charged off, we, we got some training, we charged off to do our work, we did another lessons learned. Now we're four and a half months into this project. I noticed three things. What were those three things? I don't have to tell you. I stood up and I thought, I'm going to say something about it. And I asked them this, do you see there's a pattern here? And they said, what do you mean? Well, we've gone three times now trying to solve a problem, and we try to solve it the same way every time. You all know there's a famous saying by a very famous physicist about that, right? Can anybody tell me what that saying is? It's the definition of insanity. Now, I didn't say they were insane. That would have been disrespectful. I said they were crazy. No, I didn't say that either. I said, there's a pattern here, and I've seen this before. It goes like this. We, we, each iteration, we discover some problems. We try to solve them the same way each time, and we do it over and over. That's a pattern. Now, in those days, some of you were probably old enough to remember, that was the heyday of the, uh, the patterns movement in software development, where the Gang of Four book had come out a while earlier, and everybody was looking for patterns. So I decided I should give this pattern a name. And I called it the cycle of continuous no improvements. Because <laughs> that's what it looked like to me. How long are we going to go doing this? And I'm not going to do this as a workshop because we just don't have time today. But I'm going to tell you I would normally do this in a workshop. We would actually go through and look at each one of these things. If This is how it works. If a symptom of something uh, is apparent and we try to solve the symptom, we will never get rid of the problem. We will just introduce more problems. So that's, this is what I tried to explain to them. We're dealing with symptoms, and you can't solve a problem by trying to eliminate the symptoms. So if the symptom is the estimates were off, and we try to get better at estimates, and it doesn't help us, what would the actual problem be? Now, I'm not going to answer that for you here. That's not my purpose in being here today. I'm going to try throughout the day to tell you things I'd like you to be thinking about. I'd like you to contribute to the body of knowledge in software development about these kinds of things. There is no answer. You can't learn by me telling you an answer. That's like trying to jump to the end of your, of your uh, education by someone just doing the tests for you. And that never helps anybody. Okay? If the requirement's not being clear and we learn to get better understanding of our requirements and it doesn't help, What's the problem? What's the underlying problem? And again, if they keep changing, you can see how related these are to each other. And that, I started uh, sharing my maxims at that time. I had, been, I had been gathering maxims. A maxim is like a short, pithy saying that explains some common truth that I want to remember easily. And the one that I had come up with this, I call, it's in the doing of the work that we discover the work that we must do. That was the underlying problem. They were trying to understand the work before they did the work. And you can't understand this kind of work before you do it. You have to start, you have to start trying to figure out solutions to even understand the problem. Because doing exposes reality. OK. Now, I thought I was being pretty clear and obvious and making sense. But after that moment, nobody would talk to me. <laughs> That's me, among this whole group of zombies. I was just one of the many zombies. And that's everybody else. And remember, they're 22, 23 years old. Well, I've been spending a lot of time with them. 
uh, going bike riding, hiking, because I know the area, was, it was an area where I live, and most of these kids had come from other parts of the world. Matter of fact, there were a number of programmers, maybe 30 or 40, that were from India. And they wanted to go out and see the countryside while they were in San Diego. So I would take them up in the mountains. We have mountains that are like a mile high nearby, and we would go up and do hikes and stuff. I'll give you a warning. This is not anything to do with the rest of this talk. Um, <laughs> but they, um, these were all very young and healthy people, it would seem. But when we go out and hike, I could <laughs> out-hike them by a great deal. After a half a mile or so, they had to stop for a smoke. <laughs> and honestly, I think that smoking was not helping their ability to hike. <laughs> so, and this is very true. But many of the, there was one young man who was very physically fit, strong, but he couldn't hike for more than a half mile or so before he would kind of have to, he couldn't keep enough air in his system. So here we go. These are kids I was getting to know, and now they wouldn't talk to me. So I was walking down the hall, and I thought, I need to talk to one of them to find out what's going on. So I was walking down the hall, and they were kind of spreading around me as if it was like I was Moses, you know? <laughs> and they were the Red Sea. You know that story? So they're spreading around me. And I, I, I cornered one of them by putting my hands out. Jim, Jim. And he didn't know what to do. <laughs> this is a problem when you're too young. You don't realize you could just get around that old guy. But you, he was like a, a deer, they say, a deer caught in the headlights. He just stayed there. So I had my hands out and I said, hey, Jim. I took him by the shoulders. Nobody will talk to me. What's going on? And he said, the managers told us not to talk to you. <laughs> The reason I'm sharing this with you is because this is really the bigger problem. It wasn't that it was a cycle of continuous no improvements. It was that it was unsafe to talk about the things in this company that weren't working well. Does this make sense to you? I'm looking around. This is a much bigger problem than them not understanding the cycle of continuous no improvements. So this is where I start realizing I need to learn about this and start talking about it, which is why I was really happy when the Agile Manifesto came out. Because the Agile Manifesto to me is about revealing our problems, being free to talk about them, uh, collaborating well so that we can come to a quicker resolution of things, lots of other things as well, but that safety is part of the Agile Manifesto. So no estimates I see as a placeholder for a larger conversation about the stuff that we're not allowed to talk about. Now, again, in those days, you can get a job if you could just spell VB. I already used up that joke. But uh, so I thought, well, I'm not going to stay for this. So uh, the, at the end of six months, I, uh, you could get on the phone in those days and call a recruiter and be working on another project that afternoon. There was just so much demand. So I did that. But now I started keeping notes. I started keeping notes everywhere I went to see how frequently I saw this cycle of continuous no improvements. And I saw it over and over and over. So over the next three or four years, uh, I'd taken a lot of notes about the way people were working, and I was starting to experiment with other ways to do it. And that's what I'm kind of th sharing with you right now uh, today is the idea of how did I discover these problems? And then uh, once I kind of uh, got a clarity about them, what did I do to try to resolve them? And it really came more to finding people who were also willing to talk about these things without getting judgmental than anything else. Because then we could collaborate to find solutions. And it took me almost 10 years exactly. 2009, I'd gotten my career to the point where I was well known enough in my local area that I had credibility. And people would come to me and say, hey, we're, so, we're trying to solve some of the problems you've been talking about. Can you come and help us do that? So rather than me having to just be you know, one of a stack of resumes looking for a job, people are now coming to me to ask me, how can we deal with this? And again, I don't have any, there's no magic, right? Or in another way of saying it, it's all magic. It's both, so it's a paradox. So this is where I like to share. The object isn't to make art, it's to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. And to me what this means is we need to create an environment where we can do great things. And without that environment, we cannot force great things to happen. Now, this is something I would actually want to spend a lot more time on, but we only have an hour more today. So let that soak in. And the next time I happen to be in Bangalore, you tell me if you've been able to find a way to apply this. I think this has served me well. I learned it when I was about 25 years old. 
from somebody uh, who was doing very elegant lettering on signage. And I was learning to be a sign painter at the time, working as a sign painter. And I saw this beautiful lettering, and I, and I found the person's phone number, and I called him up, and I said, I've been trying to do this lettering you do. It's just so beautiful, but I haven't been able to figure out how to do it. I mean, my lettering is similar, but it's just not elegant like yours. He said, well, come on down. I can show you how to make this lettering, but that won't help you. I have something that will help you. And this is what he shared with me. He did show me how to do those letters, but what he was really telling me was it's not, you can't force your letters to be elegant. You have to understand how a brush works, and you have to understand how paint works, and you have to ha understand how the substrate you're painting on works. There's a lot you need to understand, and then those good letters are going to happen because you're letting your materials and your tools do what they are naturally good at doing. And this is what I've tried to do in software development. Now remember, we have uh, 83 parts. We're on to the second one. I'm going to go through this one really quick as I can. No estimate started as a hashtag one day. Uh, December 10th in 2012. The only uh, one person had used it uh, prior to that for something different, not related to what we were doing uh, about a year or so earlier. And I was just using it to mark a, uh, uh, an article I had written for Ron Jeffries. Ron Jeffries had asked me, I've been talking in, with him in Twitter about how we would been to work without estimates. And he said, you know, how can that be? And he wanted to talk with me about it. And I tried to converse in Twitter, but there's a thing about Twitter. You cannot have a meaningful dialogue in Twitter. It uh, will explode immediately, and people will attack you. And if you don't have thick skin, then um, you probably don't want to be doing that. I have extremely thick skin. I don't, I don't really care if somebody understands what I'm talking about, because there will always be somebody who does. And those are the people I want to be talking with. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I can't convince. I can't even make a dog bark. You know, he goes, speak, speak. And the dog just looks at me like, you know. <laughs> so I haven't learned to do any of that convincing stuff. The thing is, I used it to reference to a post I had, and other people got attracted to it who wanted to talk with me. And so every week, I would set aside two hours to talk to somebody in the world through Skype or some other web conferencing about these ideas. And they always want to say, well, how can you work without estimates? And, uh, you know, the simple answer is, well, don't do them. It's that easy. Like, you know, how do you have coffee without sugar? Well, just don't put the sugar in. You don't have to take it back out, right? The controversy came for free. <laughs> the reason that I'm here today is because somebody in Sweden in 2013 saw how controversial this topic was and wanted me to bring that to a conference. So I believe that Twitter is good for that. I think it's actually a very powerful aspect of Twitter. It exposes ideas to many people. And if they're interesting to enough people, then you, know, you get a bigger audience. And I was simply looking for people who are willing to have this conversation. OK? So what does no estimates mean? I already told you it was just to refer to a project where we did not use estimates. And therefore, I could call it no estimates. We did no estimates. Well, how does that work? And I wrote that article to explain how we did it. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, in a bit. I still have a couple of exercises I want to do. It's not a commandment, thou shalt do no estimates. It's not, not a commandment. I'm not commanding anybody to do that. It's not a declaration. We will not do estimates. I'm not claiming that either. I won't work with estimates. If you want to hire me to come and do software in your company, that's one of my requirements. I won't do any estimates. If you want estimates, figure that out for yourself. Matter of fact, I would say, I hope, are there any managers in the room? You know, managers? If you'll admit it. OK, good, quite a few. Please don't take this wrong. I've, I've been a manager most of my life. I've owned about 16 or 18 businesses. Uh, I know what it means to own a company, and I know what it means to manage work. Um, I believe that a manager of software development should never, ever ask a developer, how long will it take to do something? If you don't already understand how long it takes to do the work you're managing, why are you a manager? <laughs> this is really serious. So how many of you have been asked to do an estimate? Show of hands. In your career, you've been asked to do an estimate. Does it make you happy when you get asked to do a question? Let's just show of hands. Do you get happy when they ask you to do an estimate? Let the record show nobody raised their hand. 
So how many of you have asked others to do estimates in software development? Show of hands. Almost as many. Does it make you happy to ask someone else to do estimates? Show of hands. Two, three, four, five. That makes us happy. Why are we doing something that doesn't make us happy? Why are we doing something that is not adding to, I would say, the uplifting nature of work? It kind of drags us down. Now, that's not a good defense for doing or not doing estimates or a reason not to. But I think that it is an indication. We've got to think this through. So to be able to do a good conversation about this, we need to have a good definition. So this is what I really want to make a point of, and that's what we're going to use this for now. If we don't have a clear definition, this is called a bounded context. We're going to give meaning to the words we're going to use within this context of a discussion. You know DDD, Domain Driven Development? You know a bounded context. This is sort of the idea. So let's talk about what you said, OK? Let's see what we got here. Oh, yes. Well, somebody did a nice job of grouping things. This is going to take me a minute because we have quite a few of them here. It won't take me too long. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any way to know, but I know with this many, you won't, most of you won't leave. Yeah, so here's the, here's the thing. There are many things we can actually estimate. I'll give a really good example of that. I can estimate approximately how much it will cost for me to, to support a team of six or eight developers. Just give me the number. I can calculate what their pay will be. I can calculate how much equipment they'll need, how much room we'll need, uh, how many software upgrades we're going to need during the year to pay for. I can, I can estimate all that. It's close enough to know for the yearly budget how much it will cost to have a team for a year. So there are things that we can, we can estimate without too much trouble. Oh, my goodness. Let's see what's over here. I think this is enough. Um, I do want to, I'm going to try and group them up pretty good. Uh, oh, this is good. Most of you were able to do it within, within uh, one word. And we're getting close to uh, some, this is a one way we can use estimates, by the way. I could have, um, I think, easily estimated the approximate distribution of your answers. Because I've done this about maybe a thousand times, over 500 times now. I'm going to put this one somewhere special because I want to talk about it separately. OK, this is good enough. So I have these different groupings that I usually get. It's a guess. 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 What is a prediction? Ah, oh, it's a guess. Yes. OK, thank you. So it's a guess. It's a guess. It's a guess. Here's somebody who said it's a probability. So we're, we're t those are all grouped. It's a probability. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then here's what's about size, time, cost, money, a number. So it's a guess that maybe we could think of as being a probability. I, I'm not sure how that comes into play. Is there a probability on our guesses? Like, I think that's a tricky one we pull on ourselves. What's that? Probability is a mathematical guess. It's a, so it's a mathematical guess. Right. So, so, and the data that we get in doing uh, software development um, estimates is sketchy at best. And it's always based on guesses, no matter how. If we do a, have you ever done a work structure breakdown? Do you know what I mean? So you say, oh, well, this is the project we want. Well, what are the different kind of feature areas? And what are the spe specific features? And what are the parts of those features? And what are the tasks to do them? Somewhere in there, we have to make a guess about how long it will take to do something, right? So this, somebody says value, but I'm going to make it real clear right now. I'm only talking about estimates of cost, size, time, that kind of thing. Not about the value, about the cost of doing software development. We also need to do estimates of value. But the only kind I'm going to discuss, remember I'm saying I want to limit it. Okay, to 
be able to measure. An estimate of software development isn't a measure. An estimate of how many fish are going through the river that are going to spawn up above so we can get a little idea of our fishery growing or shrinking, that is a measurement. But uh, th this is not a measurement. We're not measuring anything. You can't take it and actually measure it. So this is, I'm not sure that it's really a measure. So value we're going to put out, that really doesn't come into play. So that we can, we didn't get a lot of them that say planning. Two or three. Normally I would see more of the distribution will normally be more. But we also have some outliers here. Useless. Estimates are useless. Because your boss comes in and says, I've got to have useless by the end of the day. <laughs> it's meaningless. I need your meaningless uselessness by the end of the day. You know, they won't actually say that. Here's another good one. It's an illusion. And we might take it a step further and say it's a delusion. Uh, it's unreliable. Okay. So this is good enough. This grouping is very similar to this grouping. This is about what I normally see. About 50% are guess or prediction. About the time, the size, the effort. So we can do, sometimes we'll say an approximate uh, of those things. So we can do some budgeting and planning. But then we also have these dysfunctional things. Uh, so we can set a deadline. So we can manage expectations. Is there anything you like more than having your expectations managed? Every day you come and say, could somebody please manage my expectations for me? <laughs> Why do we use that terminology? So we can make a commitment or a pledge. I think some of these say promise. I'm going to show you one of these same exercises I did with a small group of C-level people, mostly CTO or CIO types. What's the first thing you notice about it? They couldn't do it with one word. And they fi finally said, OK, use up to three words. They literally couldn't do it with one word, which tells you something about the manager's mind. This is a grouping that is more or less about guessing. But let's see what they needed to do. It's an educated guess. <laughs> I love this one. It's a current best guess. Does the boss ever come in and say, just give me the worst guess you can? <laughs> best guess. Informed guess. Why couldn't we just say guess? You know, uh, ballpark value. What do we do with that, Bob? But that's a S-W-A-G, scientific wild ass guess. This is how we hear it put. <laughs> they call it a swag. And that, I was just in South Africa. In Africa, they have wild asses there who actually do a better job of estimating than humans. Somebody told me. A license to deviate. That probably should have gone off there somewhere. A quantified guess with a confidence interval. Do any of you ever work with a confidence interval? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like they'll say, well, an estimate has to have a range. But an estimate, by definition, says approximate, which implies there's a range. So if I say, it's, my estimate is 12, that means it's approximately 12, which means there's a range. So if they want to specify the range, then that just adds to it. When we specify the range, we're adding an estimate to our estimate. Well, I think it'll be between 10 and 14 weeks. And then we want a confidence level. And I'm about 70% sure. We have an estimate of our estimate of our estimate. <laughs> Do you see how that is? It's an estimate. The confidence level is an estimate. You can't prove it. It's a, it's a fallback to say, well, I said we were only 70% sure. And so, yeah, we fell into the 30% this time. Instead of three to six months, it took us 18 to 24 months. But we were close, you know? OK, so let's do an estimate. Three months from today, you have to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen. Three months from today, you know when you're going to start? How long is it going to take you to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen? Somebody tell me. Three seconds. I used to, I had a business where I had to sign the checks myself. And I could sign about 100 checks in like two seconds per check. Brum, 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 brum. They would just line them up, and I would sign those checks. You know, it doesn't take very long, long to do. But let's change this very slightly. Right now, you need to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen. How long is it going to take you? Somebody tell me. Three months. Three months. <laughs> That's what you should always tell your boss. We're learning the lessons quickly here. <laughs> How long is it going to take? Right now. Do it. Get out a blue fountain pen. <laughs> 
Does anybody here have a blue fountain pen? You have a blue fountain pen. Can I see it, please? Here's a gentleman who's prepared to do any work <laughs> at any time. No, no, this is a fountain pen. I'm going to make sure it writes. Excellent, excellent. Who has a uh, white index card? You didn't bring a white index card. <laughs> well, you're halfway there. OK, I'm going to get out a pen here. I think I've got one in here. I'm going to make a warning. Don't take a fountain pen on an airplane without removing the cartridge and putting it in a plastic bag, because it will then leak all over your stuff. So watch out. This has got blue ink in it. I go, I write the fountain pen, I write it on the, uh, on the card, I take it to the product owner. He says, no, 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 that's not correct. I said I wanted you to use a blue fountain pen, and you used a yellow one. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying here? We don't really know the requirements. How can we do the work? Now, that's one of the things, that, again, that I usually do in an exercise. I want to find out what's the first thing you do when you are asked to do an estimate. Somebody tell me, what's the first thing you do when you're asked to do an estimate? What's that? Break down. The break down. You break down and cry. <laughs> what do you do? Read the requirements. And then what do you do? Ask questions. Ask questions. Now, when I do the full-on workshop of this, that is like the same kind of distribution. Almost everybody says, we get more information. Because usually the requirements that were written down for us are not sufficient. We act as if they are sufficient. And that's one of the things I really like about Agile. With Agile software development, we worked with the people. You know, it says that one of the principles is you work daily with the business people. They call them business people, whatever that means. You work daily with the customer if you can, in a very much a extreme programming way. OK, I hope you get the idea. I got this from Davo, Davo Pancho. He worked for Agile 42 at the time. He no longer is there. He's an independent consultant in Houston, Texas. OK, so this the reason I bring this up. I want to talk about these different kinds of things we could be estimating. One is the work time. And the work time is the amount of time it actually takes to do the real work. To write my name only takes a few seconds. But to gather, gather everything together that we need could take, uh, if we have a blue fountain pen but no cards, it would take us at least a time to go find some cards somewhere. As a matter of fact, I'll take it a big step further. Were we supposed to have, could we have blue lines on the card? Because index cards often come with blue lines. It's a white card, but it's already got blue lines. Can we use those cards? We need to get that clarity. Another kind of time is the elapsed or cycle time. Cycle time, does anybody have a good definition of cycle time they want to shout out? Cycle time is the amount of time from when we start the actual work till it's completed. OK, so that's cycle time. There's also a thing called lead time. Lead time is from when the, when the customer requests something until it is delivered. So cycle time is not yet necessarily delivered, although in modern software development, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's got to be delivered and in use for us to really meaningfully learn anything about it. But this is the problem we have in our industry. While I don't think we can really estimate the work time, I think it's a trick we play on ourselves. That's why I wanted to get to all this before I, uh, before I told you any of this stuff. But we certainly, I don't think, can estimate the cycle time. It's not very useful. And lead time as well. There's no way to take the average of all our jobs and then go to somebody and say, oh, our average job takes three months. So that's what you're going to get. You know, Some of our jobs take 12 minutes, and some take two and a half years. So uh, I don't think that we can actually usefully measure cycle time. We can measure it, but what good is it to do that? That's one of the things that bothers me. Um, let's scoot on. I'm going to pass on that one. So our working definition I want to work with today, 12, 15. We go till 1, right? I'm trying to think about what's the most fun to do. You want fun or do you want to learn something? I think we're here to have fun, right? <laughs> or at least have some fun while we're learning something. 
So this is the way I like to phrase it. An estimate is a guess of the amount of time, usually the work time, uh, to create a project, a feature, or some bit of the work uh, in doing software development. So what we're doing is we're going to make guesses about this stuff. Is that useful to us? That's my first question. How do we validate that? Oh, let me bring it back. If you want to get a picture. I do. I did give a, uh, a copy of these slides to the um, conference. And they'll, they're not exactly these slides, but there's some version of them that, that have all this stuff in it. Uh, I had to break some of these in half. Uh, I'm thinking of doing this exercise. Um, no, I think I'm going to skip it. I think because it's going to take us about as much time as we have left. So I'm going to do this exercise. Why do we do estimates? I want to do this as a three-minute exercise where you would do this with the people sitting around you. Try to form groups of three or four people and come up with as many reasons as why do we do estimates. Put it on post-it notes. One idea per post-it note. One idea per post-it note. Gather with three or four people around you. And if you're sitting next to people you detest, Come up with a nice reason to move somewhere else, OK? So come up with as many as you can. We're only going to go about three minutes, so start. <laughs> Write as many as you can on the post-it notes. So I think what I'd like to do, you've discussed them. I'd like to just hear one. So somebody share one that they have. Because they think they have to. Oh, because they think they have to. That's an excellent. Does anybody else have something like that? Because you think you have to. Does anybody have something like that? Like, that's what my boss asked for. I have to do them. OK, what else? Who else? It's a traditional practice. That's very similar to because we have to. Very similar. Did anybody have something like that? It's because it's what we already do. Did anybody get that as well? These are unique so far. What's another one? To stay within budgets. How did we make the budget without the estimates? Did anybody else get to stay within budgets? Wow, we probably have a thousand unique reasons. I have the other side of it. Okay. To meet business, we do the estimates to meet business revenue goals, which are an estimate about how much we should, should be making. We're making estimates to meet an estimate. No, we, we, we're giving a goal, and I have to tell them how, what I need. What right, so they've given you a goal, but that goal is probably an estimate about what do we need to give them so they'll work harder, right? Has anybody ever said, you know what, our people don't work hard enough, we want them to work harder? And Tim Ottinger, he said, well, just take a half the keys off the keyboard. It, they'll have to work a lot harder then. <laughs> it's 
for resource commitments. So we have to know how much time so we know what people and what money we'll need. What else? Confidence of the team. Confidence. Oh, to destroy the confidence of the team? <laughs> what do we have here? To align the independent teams. To align, the to align, align dependent teams. We have to know when they'll be done so we know when we'll be done. So we know if they say two weeks, it'll be six months. And then we know when to start our work. How long will it take to deliver? We want to know how long it will take to deliver. What else? What's that? To make, decisions. to make certain decisions. I'm going to put this up at the top because that is, I think, why we do estimates. We're going to relate back to that. Let's have this one. Oh, oh so, so, value, so we're going to use an estimate of value and an estimate of cost to determine our ROI, which is return on investment. In other words, we're going to have an estimated return on investment because the real return on investment can easily be calculated. Once we've completed the work and we're making income on it, we can actually know the return on investment. But this is just a estimated. So a guess about value and a guess about effort. But why do we need to know that? So we can make a decision about what work to do. OK, let's go on. More. Can you hand that forward? Oh, it's two for one. To, to plan better. Oh, so I would say to plan, not necessarily better. Right? We want the confidence that we did our best to, to understand what was in front of us, but how do, we evaluate, how do we evaluate was it actually better planning? And then better management of the people and plans. So now we kind of had one like that, right? To know, to know the resources. But it's about the planning. But planning is about making decisions. Let's have this one. Predictability, same thing, cost. So we, we do estimates to have some predictability. It's a conversation start. But why do we want to have the conversation? To understand the... To understand so we can... Make a decision. Make some decisions. OK? Exactly. What do we have here? Traditional client contracts. Used for finalizing. So this is, this is a legitimate use of estimates, which is to make a contract with a client. So we're going to make a guess about something, and then we're going to put it in writing, and this leads to a lose-lose situation, right? We made a guess. They're expecting it to be true. So our contract is going to have six or eight pages that tells how they're going to, in the end, have to pay us a lot more money anyways. Does that make sense? Have you seen this? That often happens. Those contracts have to be really good. Time, so we know when to start marketing. So why is marketing so far behind the rest of the world in understanding lean concepts and agile concepts. This is one of the things I really am puzzled about. If you came up with something really brilliant today that's going to shut down your competition, but your marketing says, that'll take us six months to a year to plan that. We're going to waste six months to a year to get this into, into the use? I don't think so. False sense of safety. Well, OK, false sense of safety. So, we got the, the, so we're qualifying it. Yeah, we're doing it to delude ourselves. So, Let's have a few more. What's this? Raise an alarm ahead of time. Oh, so we can raise an alarm ahead of time. Dang, we have a lot of these suckers. <laughs> to measure productivity. Now, an estimate cannot measure anything in this sort, but, but the actual work we can measure. So do we, is it useful for us to measure against our guess? What will that teach us about the future? How well you guess. That our guesses are always off, right? Because it's just a guess. Estimate, to estimate well, it helps to estimate the cost to forecast the schedule. So really, we're just going to make guesses to forecast the schedule. So that's for planning, for tracking. Uh, we'll talk about these in a minute. I think we've covered enough things. Can we all see this is mostly about making decisions? Let's talk about that for just a moment. What an estimate is. We usually use it somehow to try to predict something about the future. We're trying to know something that we wish we could know. And that's legitimate. When will it be done? How much will it cost? What can we get done in this sprint? That's not so much about making the bigger decisions. That's like a very small decisions about how much work will we take in, which I think is a faulty way of working anyways. Uh, how many people will we need? Some of you brought that up. This information that we're getting, is it facts? We call them estimates. If they were facts, what would we call them? Facts. facts. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty simple, right? 
This is information. It's just information. This is stuff. This results of our estimates is just information. It's what do we do with this information? Is we're going to make decisions, and this is what worries me the most, is that we're going to use this and think we made good decisions. I have a really an inexpensive way. I can sell you one of these for for a hundred rupees. I would make a good profit on it because it says five on there. There's a decision-making tool right there. According to uh, Kahneman, our chances of making a good decision are not much better than that, using these techniques that we use. If that's really true, I can save you a lot of money, and I'll make some money in the meantime, although you could go buy these for about five rupees yourself. Matter of fact, I've got one here that's only one rupee. Do you have coins smaller than one rupee? Yeah. So there you go. So you could use a one rupee one if you're really on a budget. We have this thing about sparking conversations. I often hear that as well. But it's rare that people want to have those conversations unless we are trying to make a decision. I think it's all about making decisions. So what are the decisions we're trying to make? Let's hear some of that without doing it as an exercise. Because I want to kind of finish relatively on time. And we have about a half hour left. What are the decisions we're trying to make? Whether to do the work or not. So we have this project we'd like to do. And we're going to decide whether we can do it or not. And so somebody says, what will the value of it be? And somebody else says, what will the cost be? OK, usually, who inflates m the most? The people with the cost or the people with the value? I usually see the people with the value. Over and over again, this will add $30 million to our bottom line. They will make up numbers. There's no way to prove any of that. It's really easy to say we need to know how much it will cost to do this. But normally, so let's say this is how much time we have from beginning to end. We spend this much time making decisions, gathering information, doing the estimates, doing a bunch of requirements stuff, this much time to code and a little bit more to test. And yet, this is where the time could be compressed out of this thing if we worked in a better manner. Do you see what I'm saying? This is, this is important, just as important as the time of doing the work. Why don't we estimate that stuff? When, is any, well, some people have had this. I've had it happen to me. Has anyone ever come to you and asked, can you make an estimate about how long it will take to estimate this project? Yes. Show of hands. Has anybody ever been asked that? Look at that. Did you go, I'm looking for another job? <laughs> because that makes no sense to me. We want an estimate about how long it will take to make an estimate. Well, I can make it a guess. I can give you those, both of those in about five seconds, you know, because I'm just going to make a guess anyways. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a story about that. I, I was working at a place. This would have been in 2004 or five, And it was when I was taking a lot of notes about this stuff. And uh, my manager came to me. I was writing code on this project. And we had about 40 developers. And he came to me and said, hey, I need those estimates by the end of the day. I said, you know, I've been reading these documents, and there's just not enough information here to make estimates. He said, look, Curti got her estimates. Anders got his estimates. Greg got his estimates. Can you guess where those people were from in the world? Curti was from this part of the world. Anders was from uh, Scandinavia. And Greg was from South Africa. So I thought, well, I'm going to go ask Anders and Greg and Curti uh, how they did their estimates, because I can't figure it out. So I won't tell you the names of the people, because this might be filmed and they might see it as to who I asked what. But there was, these were the answers I got. One of them said, I just, don't, I just uh, take the list. I don't even read the documents. I just write down a bunch of high numbers. Another one said, I don't read the stuff. It just takes too much time. I just write down a bunch of low numbers, because the manager seems to like low numbers. And the third one said, I read the names and try to think, did I do anything like this before? And how long do I remember it took to, to do it? That's pretty fragile data, but that's how they got it. So I went back to my desk, and I literally just took the list and put a bunch of high numbers next to it. And I went to the boss, and I said, I got the estimates for you. He said, great. I just made up the numbers as fast as I could. Thank you. <laughs> what was he going to do with those numbers? Tell to, somebody tell me. What do you do with those numbers? He punched them into some system that they had. He just needed to put a number by each one, and then his job's done. They could put another button, and it kind of shows a, a Gantt chart or something. Uh, this is literally what he said. Thank you. 
after I told him I just guessed really quickly, I said, why couldn't you have just guessed really quick? Why did you have to ask me to guess? Have you ever seen this show? They used to have a, a way before I was born, they made these films they called The Three Stooges. Have you ever heard of The Three Stooges? So Mo is given a task by the boss guy. And Mo takes it and he turns to, to Larry and he hands Larry the, the thing. He says, get this done. And Larry takes it and he turns to Curly Joe. Get this done. And Curly Joe takes it and turns it and there's nobody to hand it to. <laughs> We're the Curly Joes in software development. They ask, they ask, they ask, they ask. We have to come up with a number and up it bubbles up. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, now there are 83 parts. We're down to the third one. Okay. I have an exercise we can do. I think I want to do this exercise. It may fail here to work the way that I like to have it work. It'll take me a minute to find a file that I can, that I can bring up, but I think I'd like to do it. Let's see what happens. It's a, so this is the problem with a lot of the um, exercises that I do. Let's try that one first. If that's the wrong one, then I'll, oh, good, this is the one. Okay, you know, that was luck. So this is, a lot of the exercise I like to do in a, in a workshop sort of depend on a sufficient number of people. This one also depends on the people having uh, some ability with the English language. Now, I know most of you probably speak the English language, or you wouldn't sit through this a workshop with me babbling on in a language you can't understand. Uh, when I was in uh, grade school, I was the only boy who could compete with the girls in spelling. So the rest of the boys were terrible at spelling. Now, I wasn't very good at sports, but I liked having something that they could cheer for me about, and so I was a pretty good speller. But once I started using these things, my spelling has gotten worse and worse. So one thing that happens to me is I will start spelling word and I'll mix up the letters. So that's what this exercise is kind of about. I'm going to give you a short list of um, words to correct the spelling. So the first thing I'd like you to do is have one or two sheets of paper. There's a bunch of those notebooky kind of things. And you can use post-it notes if you want. You're going to need a pen or a pencil. And you're going to need your phone with a stopwatch on it. Now, if you don't have a phone with a stopwatch, you could probably work off of somebody sitting next to you as long as you have a, a stopwatch going. You know, the stopwatch is you, you, you start it, you start it, and then when it's done, you can stop it and you see how long it took you. So this is what I'd like you to do. Everybody needs something to write on and something to write with. Because what you're going to do, I frequently misspell words when I'm texting something. So I, had, I was convert, having a conversation with my wife, and it wasn't this exact list, but I got a bunch of the words misspelt, and I'll usually send her a note later saying, is, was there anything here there you didn't understand? But what I'm going to have you do is actually correct the misspellings in about 10 simple words that are in English. Each word is between three and 10 letters, so they're relatively short words. Your job is just to correct the spellings. I want you to estimate, so put that down on your paper, estimate how long is it going to take for you to correct the spelling. It's really just jumbled, mostly just jumbled spellings. Each word probably starts with the correct letter. You're going you're gonna to solve 10 simple misspellings. How long is that going to take you to do? Write that down, make a guess, make a good guess. You don't need to be, don't worry about being too precise. Ballpark is fine. Scientific wild ass guess. Okay, again, everyone's got a paper. I'm going to show you the words. You start your timer. You write the words on your paper with the correct spellings. You stop your timer. You call out woot woot. When you call out woot woot, that tells me you're done. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate calling out woot woot. Where I grew up when I was a child, we had cowboys, cattle. And the cowboys would be bringing the cattle through, and they were always whooping at the cattle. they go woot woot like that. So let's practice that. When you're done, you're going to call out woot woot and stop your timer. Everybody, three, two, one, woot woot. See how easy it is? Stop All right. the timer first or woot woot first? <laughs> <laughs> Multitask. <laughs> so if we're ready to start, I'm going to count down and then I'm going to show you that list. Everybody wrote down how long it's going to take? 
Okay, so here it goes. Three, two, one. Here's the list of words. Correct each one as quick as you can. Try to do it. Uh, try to get, get your estimate if you can. It doesn't matter that much. We're going to see something about estimates. If you can't say, say everything, you might need to stand up to see it. You got wood woo when you're done. Come on, it's woo woo like that. There we go. If you can't see him, please stand up. I'm sorry about that. Hey, there we go. You might not know all of these words. What's that? We're still competing with guns. Yes. Well, this is life, okay? I want to make it clear. Most, uh, well, at least half of the intelligence in the world comes from the girls, okay? Is everybody pretty much done? Okay. We're close enough. So here's what I want to find out first. Who estimated more time than it took them? Who estimated less time than it took them? OK. We often overestimate just to make sure we can get it done on time. Now, this was unknown work, right? You didn't know how long this would take because you don't do this every day. But this was so simple. And yet, we will almost always overestimate. Now, there is also this thing, this kind of a optimism bias that humans have. Have you ever seen developers are sitting around the table and they're, they're kind of talking about the estimates? And someone says, I think that's going to take about two days. And somebody else says, no, nah, I think it'll only take about a day. And then somebody will say, I could do that in half a day. It's like they're bragging about how little time they can do it in. This is troubling. OK, I want to know the range. What was the least amount of time somebody thought it would take? 30 seconds. 30 se anybody less than 30? 20. 20. Anybody less than 20? And you still got it. Did you get it done quicker than 20? OK, what was the longest somebody thought it would take? Five minutes. So look at the range we had. Th Fifteen minutes. <laughs> Wise. <laughs> Somebody once told me, if your boss asks you how long it will take to do something, it's never less than two weeks. <laughs> so 15 minutes. So we had a range of 30 se well, 20 seconds to 15 minutes. Could you make an estimate for how long it would take someone else to do it? And yet, when we are going to decide how many people we need to hire, that's exactly what we've done. We don't even know the people yet, and we're estimating how long it's going to take them to do something. Interesting. I have another quick one to do. This is a very much shorter exercise. The reason, I, by the way, that I want to talk about the ranges and so on is that um, some people will ask three or four people for an estimate, and then they'll take an average. And I'm not sure. I think that we're trying to pretend that that somehow gives us value. And there are some people who actually propose that as a way of doing estimates. I'm not sure that's useful. OK, I have another very simple exercise. It won't take you long to do it all. I'm going to show you the first and last letters of a common five letter word. You're going to see the first and last letters, and you need to fill in the three other letters. I want you to do as fast as you can. Your job is to fill in the blanks to create that five-letter word. You're going to know the first and last letters, and you need to fill in the blanks. How long will it take? Write down how long you think it will take. Pretty much the same process. I, wa I want you to improve a little bit on your routing. That was a little weak. <laughs> but have your stopwatch ready. How many words? How many words? One word. I want you to estimate how long it will take if it's going to take you the quickest. It's not going to take you 15 minutes. How long is it going to take to do? OK, write that down, and then I'm going to show it to you. And I want, I'm going to count down 3, 2, 1, and we'll show it. Do it as quick as you can. So you start your watch as soon as I got counted down. Stop your watch as soon as you're done and call out woot woot. I expect to hear a lot of woots pretty fast. 3, 2, 1, fill in the blanks. Don't say anything. For, uh, Any more woots? 
It's kind of like a pack of uh, popcorn that you put in the microwave. All righty. So I want to ask you, I want to ask, what words did you come up with? Give me a word. How many had, how many had sleep? 50% of you had sleep. Why? Here are the pos some of the possible words. Scrap, stamp, steep, strip, scalp, set up, sharp. Scoop, scamp, sco sc oh, snoop, scamp, scoop, sheep, stomp, and sweep. Why did you say sleep? What's that? This is called priming. You were primed. Now I'm going to make this really, really clear. There is almost no way to make a decision without priming having happened. There was a, there was a study done about pricing of items. You probably have read about this one. You take the last two numbers, if you have an identification number that's got you know, digits, you take the last two numbers, you write them down for each item of a list of items you need to propose a price for. So the first one, you would write the last two digits of your ID, and then you'd write the price you propose. The next one, you would write the two, last two digits of your ID, you write the price you propose. The people who have a small last two numbers, guess what happens? They come up with smaller numbers for their estimated prices. Totally arbitrary priming. There are all sorts of things like this that happen to us. Have you ever seen a, a, a manager come into a team? I saw this exact thing uh, two years ago about on a project I was working on. I was helping this team learn some stuff. And the manager came in and said, we were getting ready to deploy that afternoon. They were on like a two-week deployment schedule. And the manager came in and said, the customer wants one more thing before we deploy it. Why were they doing this? They weren't praying, right? They were small. They were saying, I need one more thing. And the tone of voice says, it's tiny. That's, that's anchoring. The higher level of the person doing this, the stronger that priming is. I'm going to see if I can find, I might have some, I have some studies from the IEEE that show this drastically. They did a, Items where they, they gave some guidance, different types of guidance to get different groups, and a control group. And the guidance really affects what numbers we come up with. If we get that far, we only have 15 minutes left. I think I want to go about another, I think I'm going to skip to uh, how I work. Do you want to hear how I work? Yes. Okay. I want to make it clear, this is not actually useful to you. <laughs> Everywhere you go, it's different. I started with a mechanism that I had learned in the 90s. Um, let's see if we, oh yeah, we were at the third part. I have to skip to the, down to one of the other parts. You can see there's a lot, you know what, I'm just going to flip through these just so you can see the pictures because there's a lot of cool pictures. My wife is a children's book illustrator and author. She's just sold her seventh book to a publisher and so I get to, occasionally use some of the art that she's done, so that's where these all come from. We'll just skip this through real quick. Um, Feynman. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. We will, this is confirmation bias, we will always trick ourselves. Humans almost cannot help from tricking themselves. If they have something they believe in, they will discard the information that proves they're wrong and only accept information that indicates they're right. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly go through these things. How can we improve our chance of getting wonderful? How is it that something that seems so right, estimates could potentially be wrong? How much work does it take before we have enough understanding to be able to give a reasonable estimate? These are the kind of questions I ask people when I'm trying to guide them into telling me whether their estimates are actually working for them or not. There's more work to do in getting that understanding than in doing the software development itself. This is why I am so troubled by the way estimates are usually used. How do we know that we made a good decision? I've asked this question to thousands of people in groups like this, and nobody yet has come forward with a reasonable way that they prove that they made a good decision based on their estimates. I'm just asking you to consider these things. Are the things we think we want a trap? 
does it lead us to this sunk cost bias? After we've spent so much time deciding to do this work, how long does it take and how hard is it to say, we better not do this work? Once we've got to the top point where we set aside the budget and started working on it, we become, do we become inflexible? Can I ask something? Yes. A previous question, you would, you would have shown wedding ring. This one? The next one. There. You would have shown a wedding ring there. That's why it's a wedding cake. Did I spell it wrong? <laughs> what did I do? Oh, I will warn you right now. I've been married for 36 years, and if you're not married, you should be. <laughs> and if you get married, be sure you marry someone who's perfect for you, because otherwise it's a pain. So I happen to luck out, and my wife is just absolutely wonderful. Everything that I've learned uh, that's important came from her. All of the wisdom I have somehow came from her. So be careful in making that decision, please. I will warn all of you, if you're not already married, make a good decision. If you already are, nothing I can do for you. I hope you made a good decision. Is this acting as a hardening agent so that it's hard for us to undo the decisions we've already made? Is getting better at estimates the only way? When I travel around the world like I do, I gain weight. Because everywhere they give me too much food. And there's always candy. And I can't avoid eating the candy. So in Sweden is a real good example. Every place I go in Sweden, they bring out a dish of candy in the afternoon. And as I walk around doing my workshops, I'll eat the candy. So my question is, if I don't want to gain weight, how can I better eat that candy? Should I chew it faster? Chew it slower? Swallow it whole? Eat it with a carrot? Um, <laughs> Should I chop it into little bits? Should I uh, liquefy it? How can I eat the candy and not gain weight? <laughs> Don't eat the candy. It's that simple. Otherwise, I have to walk. If I eat candy today, I have to walk 10 miles tomorrow instead of 5 miles just to work off those calories. If the type of decisions we are using require that we use estimates, are there other kinds of decisions we could be making? So I'm going to cover one little bit, and I'll share with you how I work. There won't be any time for questions after this. That's a good thing, because I have no answers. <laughs> Is being on time and on budget a good measure of whether or not we made a good decision based on the estimates? That's meaningless. And yet I've seen people dinged or you know, uh, in trouble on a job because they didn't get their work done as they promised by their estimates. So we get this thing called creative accounting. This is just a little bit that I'm sharing. I've seen people do feature cuts. Now, feature cut isn't where we just haven't started work on this feature yet. We've done substantial amount of work on this feature, but we can't get it into production because we can't get, we can't fix the bugs in it. So we cut that feature. We've wasted a lot of time. As a matter of fact, it's usually near the end of a project. And then we finish it and we say, we got done on time but we also didn't get all the features we had promised. Is that really on time and on budget? No. But here's, we're starting to get into some pretty tricky territory. Do we have to work late or extra hours? Now, I don't know how it is here in India, but it's not unusual in the US, or at least it used to be, I don't know exactly if it's that way now, that we are required to work extra hours near the end of the project. Do we have that here too? It's assumed this will happen. Yeah, I used to argue with my managers, why don't we start with way too many hours, and then as we start getting worn out, then we'll reduce the hours so we can keep working. But we do it the opposite. By the time we've run out of money and time, we increase the hours. I don't think that's good, but here's a much worse one. Not recording all the hours against the project. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been required to do that. I have been asked to do this, and I told, what do you think I told my manager? I said, hey, no problem. You write down whatever hours you want. I'm not going to lie on the documents. So if you think that we got to write down that this, this time wasn't for this project, because you get paid your wage anyways, this is unethical, in my opinion. I won't do that. OK, so bear to business, and we'll end with this, and then I'll go on how I've worked. The fear of losing control is a big barrier for change. 
although much of the control is merely an illusion of control. And I would replace much with all, but the fear is real. This is the issue. This is the problem. We want things to make us feel like we're in control. We want things that make us feel like we have certainty. Okay, so let's see. We'll go through this real quick. You can see all these pictures of important people. It just makes it look like, you know, I'm doing something right. And now, again, with my warning, I'm just telling you how I've worked. Does anybody still have, like, a pretty much a can, – can you, can you give me, like, a – does anybody have, like, a huge stack of Post-it notes still? Can you have a, a, still a few – yeah, I just want a big stack. There. Yeah, let's have these both. Oh, that's perfect. We're going to pretend this is a requirements document. Somebody's come to me and they said, we need to get this thing done. And they've already written all those requirements. Have you ever been on a project like that? Now, I've had it where they come to me like this. We need a reporting system. How long will that take? I can do you a reporting system in like five minutes. What's the report you need, you know? Uh, but other than that, I can't even give you a guess, right? So let's say they define the reporting system. Matter of fact, the example I'm going to give you in a bit, I call the 12 calculations. So I'll explain that in a moment. I can't tell you what to do or whether or not you should do it. I've worked without estimates for about 10 years now. This is how requirements usually come to me. The, the, the person with them believes they have a very neat box that contains all the information they need, and they can close that box up, put the latch on, put it on my desk, and say, this is what I want you to write. See you in six months. But it's never that way. It's a little bit more like this. Okay, this is a work of art, by the way, and this is a work of art by Jackson Pollock. He was an abstract expressionist. But this isn't what it's really like. To me, this is what it's really like. It's fuzzy around the edges, and it's fuzzy in the middle. We see some patterns. We don't yet understand those patterns. To me, it's like a haystack. You ever heard of that, looking for a needle in the haystack? It's hard to find without a good, powerful magnet. But what I want to do is I want to think of that big chunk of work they're bringing to me, not as a whole bunch of already predefined stuff that isn't correct anyways, but more like an idea of the stuff. And we're going to discover the needles that are in there. I don't care about all the straw. I just care about the needles. So if in the doing of the work we discover the work we must do, then we have to start working. So you tell us something you want, and we're going to start working on it. So we're not going to do this as a workshop thing that we usually do. But I would ask normally, what's the criteria we use to determine the size of a story? Those are the things that's interesting to me, not the estimate itself. So I'm looking for certain qualities that have nothing to do with size. The qualities that I'm looking for are basically these. Is it potentially valuable? Is it understandable? Is it distinct? Is it cohesive? That means the parts of this belong together. It's, if I get that, then I have something I can work on. So out of all of this, this is never going to be these, those things. I've actually had people bring me 80 or 100 or more pages of requirements and say, here's what we want. And I go, you know, that's going to take me a month to understand. We're going to have to have lots of meetings. Just tell me something in here you really like. Let's start with that. So this requires no estimates. If I can find those qualities in some little part, I can start working on it. Now, I know this is going to go really fast for you taking pictures. Just take a movie. That will be better. <laughs> this requires no estimates. I can then decouple a chunk, work on it, deploy it, get it used by somebody, and then provide, that'll provide feedback. That's what I'm after. I want to steer towards the good stuff, not plan it all ahead of time. So if I can do that, do the work, now we have a cycle. If you are at an Agile conference and they don't use these kind of curvy arrows, it's not an Agile conference. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I always put curvy arrows in there. OK. So I'm going to give you quickly the 12 calculations example. They had at a place I was working 12 calculations they would do to plan next week's production on an assembly line, a huge assembly line, with, let's just say, a couple thousand workers. Three or four people would work all weekend to do that. So on Monday, they would know exactly what to work on, which machines are going to be running, which parts are going to be manufactured. They were working in a relatively lean way. They were doing all those calculations by hand, and they described all the calculations. 
So we looked at the project, and I said, well, I don't quite understand all of this. Show me something that you really want first, and let's do it. And they actually chose this calculation here. How do I know? Because these are all just made up, and they represent calculations. So they chose that one. And I said, great, let me read your document. I read it and said, boy, there's way too much here for me to understand. Give me the essence of it. And they did. They said, OK. So what you said, we need this and this and this. I said, well, really, those things are not cohesive. We could do one and then the other. That's how we decouple. When we find that things are not cohesive, now I'm not talking about cohesive like classes. I'm talking about cohesive just in the matter of these are the things that are drawn together and must stay together. I then said, OK, I understand some of this. This chunk here we don't yet understand. But I think if we were to deliver this, it would give you a little bit of value. What if we could do this, and then you could start using it? Would that be useful? Yeah. So we did it. It took us about a day, and we deployed it. And they started using it. It helped them do a small part of that one calculation. But here's the bonus to it. Now, we have three minutes left, so let's see if we can do this. Here's the bonus to it. From doing that one, they realized that this first one over here, the funny looking little one there, would have been more important to have done first. But they learned something. We're now steering. So I said, well, which one is that? And they said, oh, it's this one here. I'm sorry I'm ruining this pack of stickies, but I'm trying to be realistic. And we did the same process. We said, what do we understand? Would that be value? Yeah. Here's stuff that's not cohesive. Let's get it out of there. We've now finished that much of this much work. We did that one more time, and for demonstration purposes, I'll actually rip the paper. Sorry, I'm wasting paper. We ended up doing this much work. And what do you think then happened? They said it's enough for now. This is the big win. Now, I used to call this the 80-20-80-20. When I first started doing this in 2002 or 3, I thought somebody said, well, guy, most of the application uh, value comes from about 20% of the features. So I said, well, why don't we just do those? Well, because we don't know what they are up front. Let's discover them. This is a process of discovery. We got rid of the biggest pain points, and they became interested in something else. So what if we could just do that 20%? But what I want to do, I only want to do 20% of each of those we choose. So we're going to use it 20% so that we've chosen something to work on, and then let's only do 20% of that feature. That was my logic behind it. So how much work would we have to do if this was true, mathematicians? 4%. 2 times 2, 4. 4%. 4% of the work, but what did I find? It was way less than 4% of the work. And this has happened for me over and over and over. Over and over. Since I first applied this in 2003 on an actual client, I just I was flabbergasted by how much value we got. I call this deliver features until bored. The moment they become bored, we can move on to another more valuable thing for them. But we can't do that if we decided up front to do all of this work. All that estimating and stuff was to decide to do this chunk. We don't do, need to do estimates to do this chunk. So I'm going to end it with that. What if we could crank up our ability to find these potential valuable chunks and deploy them? And that's what Agile gives us. And again, I'm going to show you another circle because this is an Agile conference. You need a circle. Somewhere in this process, we're learning stuff. Where are we learning stuff? Every single step. Every single step. And this, if we could just do that over and over, I'm talking about daily deployments, not with feature flags and stuff like that. That's OK. But try to deploy actual usable stuff. Working this way now over 10 years, I have not done an estimate in 10 years in software development. Now we're on to part six, but we've run out of time. So thank you very much. Is it going to be lunch out there now? So that means we can hang out in here if people want to ask questions. Is that right? If you want, I mean, if you're not already sick of this, um, I do have a whole bunch of stuff, but just not. 90 minutes wasn't enough, but thank you so much. I appreciate it.